Let's take the Word of God this morning and turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, in chapter 6. <clears throat> As you turn there and make your way to Isaiah, chapter 6, we have been looking at God's attributes, and we've grouped God's attributes into two sections, and I'm aware that there are many ways uh, in which to um, classify God's attributes, but I, I try to put them into two different categories. In the first category is God, God's confined attributes. Those are the attributes that only God possesses. Uh, these attributes can, uh, are only true about God. Uh, we talked about uh, the truth that God is eternal. He is immutable. He is unchangeable, unchanging. He is omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere present, and omnipotent, all-powerful. And we come now to God's uh, communicable attributes. So this is a, an, another classification of God's attributes. The confined attributes are only true about God. They can never be said about man. We are not eternal. Uh, we had a beginning. God did not have a beginning. We are not all-knowing. Uh, as much as some people like to think that they're all-knowing, we are not. Uh, we are not um, omnipotent, and we are not omnipresent, and we, we are mutable. Okay, we are changeable, but God is unchangeable. But now I want us to consider some of God's communicable attributes, and these, I call them communicable attributes because they are in a limited way communicable. Man in his relationship with God may exhibit these attributes in himself and in his life. For example, we're going to look at this morning that God is holy. And uh, I begin with God's communicable attributes, with God's holiness, and I hope we'll understand why this morning, but God is just. He is a just God. He is a righteous God. He is uh, love. He is merciful. He is gracious, patient, good, faithful, uh, on and on it goes. But we find these attributes uh, that are revealed in God's relationship with man. And I want us to look at as we look in our text in Isaiah chapter 6, notice with me, let's begin reading in verse 1. So Isaiah 6 verse 1, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. So Isaiah is speaking here of this vision he received, and he said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now this is important. Uh, Isaiah is going to communicate what he saw and what he heard. And this is what God wants us to know about Him. And uh, notice, the Lord is seen sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Verse 2, Above it, above the throne, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, so the seraphims, and said, so this is the scene, and this is what not only Isaiah sees, but what he hears. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the, Lord, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I want to bring your attention to verse 3. And this is what Isaiah said he not only sees, but hears. This is what the seraphim says, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. And so the lesson this morning is entitled, Holy is the Lord of hosts. I want to talk about this attribute of God's holiness. The word holy, um, there's many ways to describe this word, but it means pure. It means to be, if you would, uh, set apart, separate. Christ is said in the book of Hebrews to be holy and at the same time, separate from sinners. Uh, the word holy, if you look at a, a good Bible dictionary, it means to be whole, to be entire or perfect. Uh, as it is applied to God, holy signifies that He is 
God is perfectly pure. He is immaculate and complete in moral character. And we often call a man holy when his heart is conformed in some degree to the image of God. Uh, and his life is regulated by divine precepts that come from a holy God. Now, as we think about the holiness of God, it is appropriate for us to think of this attribute as the one attribute which God would have us most remember Him by. Let me say that again. It is appropriate for us to think of this attribute of the holiness of God as the one attribute which God would have us most remember Him by. Now, that's not my opinion, uh, for the Scripture reveals that uh, very clearly. I read a quote this, uh, t this week. It says, a Power is in His arm, omniscience is in His eye, mercy in His bowels, eternity His duration, but holiness is His beauty. And as we think about the holiness of God, I'm, I wrote down some statements that um, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write down because we're, I want to talk, if we have time to, I don't know if we're going to have time to go through everything this morning, but I want to talk about God's holiness as the one attribute that God would have us most remember Him by. And I'm, I made a, a number of statements that uh, I think will help us as we think about this particular attribute uh, that is always true of God. Um, as we look at our text here in Isaiah chapter 6, we read verse 1, we see what Isaiah saw, and then we go to verse 3, and he communicates what he saw, also what he heard. And what we read here is that the word holy, describing God, is repeated three times. Uh, that is not just true here in Isaiah chapter 6, it is also true in Revelation chapter 4. If you go with me, we have another scene. This time, John sees the Lord in Revelation chapter 4. And if you turn there, uh, we have some similarities here in Revelation chapter 4. If you, uh, let's uh, look at verse 1. So, if you look through the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, uh, the Lord speaks to John, and uh, then there is the letter to the seven churches in chapter 2, chapter 3. And now we come to chapter 4, and the scene is no longer on earth, but now the scene is in heaven. And John says in verse uh, 1, Revelation 4, 1, After this I looked. Now notice, that's we see Isaiah. Isaiah saw. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with, uh, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so here we, we see that John describes what he is seeing, what he is looking upon. Um, he describes, you could read verse 2 down to verse 8, but let's uh, go to verse 8. Notice what uh, John describes, and the four beasts had each of them six wings with him. Now, that's what we see. Remember, there was two wings covering the top, two wings covering the bottom, and two wings flying, so that's six wings. So that matches the description in, Re in Isaiah 6. And the Bible says, and they were full of eyes within, and, the rest not and they rest not day and night, saying, this is what they said, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we learn as we look at those two scenes, the one in Isaiah chapter 6 and the one in Revelation chapter 4, the first thing we learn about God's holiness is this, that first, the holiness of God is the only attribute in all of Scripture successively repeated three times. Okay? Now this is just observation. The holiness of God is the only attribute in all of Scripture successively repeated three times. In other words, what I'm saying here is that there is no other attribute of God that is given such an emphasis. No other attribute. Now, there are a lot of other God's attributes. God is eternal. He's immutable. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's almighty. All those things. He is just, righteous, gracious, whatever you want to put it. No other attribute is mentioned like this one. 
Right? Now, God is just, and we read about it. But this one is emphasized and given particular attention. And so uh, we find here that this must be a very important attribute. And by the way, one day, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 47, 8, one day we will join in this chorus with the heavenly host. Uh, who'd like to turn uh, to Psalm 47, verse 8? Who'd like to read that? Psalm 47, 8, right? Go ahead. So let's look at Psalm 47, 8 here and, and uh, look at what the psalmist uh, says. Go ahead. Okay, so God reigneth over the heathen. Yep. And God sitteth upon the throne of His holiness. Now notice in both those scenes in Isaiah 6 and in Revelation 4, God is seen sitting on a throne. And what is said about God and His throne is, holy, holy, holy. And what the psalmist here says is that God, He sits upon the throne of His holiness. And so... The holiness of God, again, is the only attribute in all scriptures successively repeated three times. In other words, this is the attribute that God would have us most remember Him by. When we have a scene in heaven, okay, when God allows man the opportunity to see what is, or what heaven looks like, where God sits, and what is the, uh, the atmosphere, the atmosphere is dominated by the holiness of God. And so when we look at that, I believe that it is important for us as we think about God's communicable attributes to begin with God's holiness. If we um, go to the first mention of the word holy in all scripture, it's found in Exodus chapter 3. So let's turn there to Exodus chapter 3 and let's, let's look at this first mention and... and uh, See what we can learn here about the holiness of God. So Exodus chapter 3, we, we are, if you've been in church for some time, familiar with this scene. And uh, Moses fled Egypt after the murder of the Egyptian. And if you would, the, um, the refusal of the children of Israel to accept Moses as their leader. Who made thee a ruler over us? That's what they said. And so uh, Moses leaves. He... Um, he was about 40 years of age. Then he is going to spend uh, the next 40 years working for his father-in-law, Jethro. And here he has been keeping sheep. And we have the scene which we refer to as the burning bush uh, experience. And we come, notice, let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. There's a pattern in Scripture, I'm not going to go into that, but there's a pattern in Scripture uh, that uh, fire represents the holiness of God, or light, fire, represents the holiness of God. Here, there's a burning bush, not just a bush, it's a burning bush. The bush was burning, but was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside, verse 3, and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now, this is the, in the next verse we're going to read, verse 6, or verse 5 and 6. This is the first time the word holy is mentioned in the Bible. It is when God spoke to Moses. And notice in verse 5, and he said, God says, draw not nigh hither. So God said to Moses, don't come any closer. You're curious about the bush. You see that it's burning, but it's not consumed. But before we proceed any further, don't come forward. So why? Why? He says, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So God first told Moses, he said, draw not thy hither, 
There is something that Moses must first do before he draws nigh to God. And he says, put off your shoes from off thy feet, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. So before God formally introduces himself, as it's been known through the patriarch as, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, before he goes and introduces himself in the familiar way, um, he first establishes that Moses was standing on holy ground. Now, was the ground itself holy? The dirt that was there, was that holy? No. However, the dirt became holy because of the presence of God. You see, Moses would first need to take off his shoes because the place where he was standing was holy ground. And so, get this, before God even speaks to Moses and says, I am the God of thy father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he says, don't, we're not going any further, because there's something that you have to first recognize before, we, before I even speak to you. Uh, and so we find here that secondly, my second statement that I wrote down is that the holiness of God is the attribute that is established as the basis for our fellowship with Him. The holiness of God is the attribute of God that is established as the basis for our fellowship with Him. When God speaks with man, it is not God coming down. Rather, it is man coming up. Now, I know God is on earth there, right, speaking to Moses. And uh, we know God is everywhere present, but that particular place where Moses was, God saying, you're standing on holy ground. I know God is everywhere present, and... Uh, and so, uh, wherever it is, yes, it's a holy place. But I'm talking here about, uh, this is not, if you would, God coming down to Moses' level. God wants to bring Moses up to his level. And he wants Moses to recognize something that he doesn't usually recognize. So before he speaks to him, he says, I want you to know that the place where we are communicating right now is holy ground. So you're going to do something to recognize my holiness. Let's take your shoes off. So the holiness of God is the attribute that is established as the basis of our fellowship with Him. Now, why is that so important? Why do I make that statement? Uh, because of what's going on in the name of God today. You know, people talk about worshiping God and uh, praising God and uh, they, they speak of God and they, they represent God as somehow this, this buddy next door, the, this family member. They, uh, even there's songs today that, that are so grievous. When I hear those things, I, I, I'm just disturbed. It turns my stomach. It makes me sick when I hear songs like, J.C. is in the house. How blasphemous and disrespectful to portray God or the Lord Jesus Christ as if he's like, you're, you're just your best friend, your buddy. The basis of our fellowship with him is his holiness. God says, before I'm going to speak, before we're going to have fellowship, before we're going to have communion, you have to recognize something that is very important for you to recognize above anything else that you ought to recognize about me. And that is, Moses, that I am holy and because I'm here, the place where you're standing right now is holy ground. See, the church should never be involved in trying to misrepresent the Lord and to bring Him down. No, man must be brought up to God. He ought to be reverenced. He ought to be recognized for His holiness. When we, when we come to church, why do we come to church? Why do we do what we do in the service? Why do we begin with prayer? Is that just because we do a ritual? Why do we sing hymns? Why do we don't bring the world's music in? Why? Because the, the hymns are rich with who God is. We love the song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We sing that song, why? Because that is the basis of our fellowship. We don't want to bring God down to man's level uh, we want to come up to His level and say God is holy, and we want to recognize that. It is the basis of our fellowship. Now, we find uh, this again if you uh, look at Joshua chapter 5. This is not the only time this happened. 
Now, Joshua chapter 5, remember, at the beginning of the book of Joshua, Moses the leader is dead, and so he, he's, Moses is not around. And um, uh, God has um, raised up Joshua to lead the people here into the promised land and to defeat the enemies. And uh, We know there's some turmoil, some sin going on in the camp in the first few chapters in the book of Joshua. But notice here, there's the captain of the host. If we begin in verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, So... <laughs> The Lord is about to speak, and you say, well, why do you say the Lord? It says the captain of the host. Well, if you read over into chapter 6, verse 2, and the Lord said unto Joshua, so God is speaking. Uh, I believe the captain of the host is the Lord Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, appearing to Joshua here. And he says, before he is going to speak, he says, loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy, and Joshua did so. Now, when Joshua does so, we go into chapter 6. Now, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given thee thine hand uh, into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty man of valor. And so before God speaks to Joshua and he is going to reveal to Joshua the plan, he says, All right, before I go any further, you're going to have to take your shoe off, off your foot, because you're standing on holy ground. When we have a church service and we say, when we, we come to church, we want to have a meeting with God. We don't come to meet with each other, although that's part of it and that's a benefit and it's great. But we come to meet with God. And because we come to meet with God, the basis of our meeting with God is His holiness. We don't come on our own terms. We come on God's terms. And God's terms throughout the Bible is His holiness. He wants man to be aware of His holiness. God could have said whatever He wants. He could have said, I'm the Almighty, bow before me. I'm the righteous judge, bow before me. I'm the God of grace, bow before me. No, He says, I'm holy. Take off your shoes. So, the holiness of God is the attribute that is established as the basis of our fellowship with Him. You see, those who claim to meet with God but have no concern for His holiness are indeed not meeting with God at all. You see, before the answer came, Joshua had to recognize something about God. Before the Lord spoke to Joshua, as we see in chapter 6, verse 2, Joshua had to recognize that he was standing on holy ground. There would be no proceeding until Joshua loosed his shoes, God did not just want Joshua to know what he said until Joshua knew who he was. And what God wanted to know, Joshua, about who he was is, I am holy. You see, often people like to talk about what God says and how God has spoken to them. And I say, well, the basis of what God says has to be his holiness. Are you sure it's God speaking? Because if you don't approach God with a, uh, an awareness, a consciousness that He is a holy God, then perhaps it is not God speaking, but simply someone or something else. Um, we could go to the book of um, Exodus. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Uh, this is, uh, we know Exodus chapter 20, the law is given. Uh, but what is interesting is what God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel before the law is given. This is known as God's holy law. It's called God's holy law. Uh, the mount that God would speak here would be a holy mount. Why? Because that's where God revealed himself to man. That's where, where God spoke to man. Now, if you um, notice with me, let's go to verse 7 of Exodus 19. The Bible says, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their face all of these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all, the, all that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, okay, 
God is about to speak to them, right? Exodus 20. And the children of Israel said, whatever God says, we will do. God is about to say something, and whatever he says, we will do. But wait, something has to happen before God speaks. What is that? Verse, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready again against the third day. And the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people of Mount, upon Mount Sinai. Go down even to verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Why, why would they do that? Because God is about to give His holy law on the holy mount in His holy presence and He wants the people to know before I speak to you what you have to recognize is that I am a holy God and you have to watch yourself and cleanse yourself and set yourself apart because I'm about to speak to you. You see, all that is going on in our country in the name of God and churches and people preaching the word or, you know, I, I, you know it's not really preaching the word. I don't know what they're doing. But they, they come across and say, I'm speaking on God's behalf, but they do not communicate the holiness of God. And I say, God is not speaking unless you recognize His holiness. God wants His people to recognize before He speaks that He is holy. You see, if we do not recognize that God is holy, it is evident that God will not speak. And so before the law was given, the people were commanded to sanctify themselves and to wash their clothes. There's a third statement that I'd like to make about the holiness of God, and that is, thirdly, that the holiness of God is the first attribute that must be remembered as we speak to God in our praying. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. As you turn there to Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> Uh, Jesus Christ is teaching His disciples to pray. Now, I, I've spent some time uh, in our discipleship lessons talking about prayer, how do we pray to God. And this is a good passage of Scripture to study if we're going to uh, pray in the will of God and appropriately. And I I've talked about that. We even did a series on uh, in the school of prayer with Christ and looked at some specific instances when Christ prayed. But here He's teaching His disciples and notice what he says. So Matthew chapter 6, he had just told them not to be like the heathen, not to use vain repetition, uh, because that's what the heathen do, and not to pray standing upright to, to have the accolades of men. Now he tells them, uh, let's see here, verse 9. So Jesus speaks to his disciples, and he says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. And then he said, Hallowed be thy name. Uh, here it is. Now Jesus Christ taught His disciples to pray. He not only demonstrated an exemplary prayer life, but He also gave them a pattern for their praying. And the first request, the first petition in this prayer is what? Hallowed be thy name. When we come to God, we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's, what does hallowed mean? The word hallowed means to make holy. That's what it means. To sanctify, to purify, to set God apart, to honor, to glorify. And so we, we ask the question here, and I've answered this before as we've looked at this lesson, are we praying for God to be made holy? Well, not in the sense because God already is holy. And are we asking God to be, to be set apart? No, he, he is already set apart from man and from the world. But this request in our praying is that God might be made holy to us. There's nothing that I'm going to say that's going to add to God. But what I have to do is I have to recognize in my life who He is. And when we pray, 
hallowed be thy name. We're saying, God, I recognize who you are. You are holy, and I recognize that in my life now. And I pray because I want you to be made holy in my life. That is my great desire because I know that that's the first thing you want me to know about you. The first petition, the first request in the prayer. There is nothing we understand that can be added to God, but God has revealed himself to us as primarily a holy God and he wants us to make sure that we recognize his holiness. What is to be hallowed, he says, his name. Hallowed be thy name. And so as we begin our prayer, our first concern about ourselves, right, uh, or our first concern should not be about ourselves. Rather, our first concern is that God would be made holy in us. You see, what we have trouble is we, uh, we want to develop our, our own ideas about God. And so when Jesus Christ, when you pray, Our Father which art in heaven, He says, this is how you begin. Hallowed be thy name. Now, not that we repeat the exact same words and over and over again. He just sends out to do that. But it, it's, a, it's a pattern of prayer. When we approach God, it'd be good for us not to rush in and out, but to pause and to say, who am I talking to? And the one that I'm talking to wants me to know above anything else that he is holy. And so what I want to do first is in my heart, I want to remake him holy in my life. So the holiness of God is the first attribute that must be remembered as we speak to God in our praying. And by the way, that will help our prayer. It will help us when we pray. Because then we're not going to pray for things that we ought not to pray for if we would begin with God's holiness. You see, what comes out of a self-interest is going to be gone because God is recognized for who He is. You see, it's, it's going to be difficult for us if we first recognize the holiness of God for us to ask something that may be consumed upon our own lust. There's another statement I'd like to make, and that is, let's turn, if you would, to 1 Peter. Let's read the verse, and then I'll make the statement. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1. We'd like to read verse 15 and 16. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. All right, John, go ahead. Okay, now here this is a quote from the book of Leviticus on several occasions. For example, Leviticus 19.2, the Bible says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Again, he says later in Leviticus 27, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am holy. And so here, 1 Peter 1.15, he says, Be ye holy, he's talking to New Testament believers, because I am holy. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, here's the statement. Uh, number four is that the holiness of God is the only attribute that God directly calls upon His people to exhibit in His likeness. In my study of the scriptures, I have not found another attribute that God calls upon His people to exhibit while referencing it about Himself. In other words, you don't find instruction where it says, well, God is gracious, so you be, be gracious because God is gracious. Well, you love because God is love. No, this is the only attribute directly referenced that God wants man to exhibit in His likeness. Now, are we to be just and gracious and righteous? Yes, we're to be all those things. But this is the only attribute that God directly references when He wants that exhibited in His people. There's commands for those other attributes to be uh, lived out. But this is the only one that He calls upon His people to exhibit in His likeness. Now, if you thought about one, I, obviously I don't know every single verse, but... In my study this week, I was looking, I was like, there, there might be another one. And so if you find one, please let me know. But I just couldn't find another one. God wants us to do, to be, to demonstrate a lot of His attributes, those communicable attributes in us. 
He wants us to be just. He wants us to be righteous. He wants us to be gracious. He wants us to uh, demonstrate charity. Uh, he wants us to have wisdom. He wants us to be all those things. But the holiness of God is the one that he calls upon in his likeness. Where he says, be holy. Why? Because I am holy. So it's important. So the holiness of God is the only attribute that God directly calls upon his people to exhibit in his likeness. Number five, the holiness of God stands as the preeminent attribute in the hearts and minds of those who would truly worship Him. The holiness of God stands as the preeminent attribute in the hearts and minds of those who would truly worship Him. Let's look at a few scripture here. Who would like to read Psalm 29, 2? Psalm chapter 29, verse 2. Not all at once, let's not all rush together. Ray, uh, Psalm 99, 9, Brother Wagner, and then Isaiah 57, 15, Mark. So let's look here. Uh, first of all, in two, uh, two Psalms, uh, Psalm 29, 2. <laughs> so how do we worship the Lord? We worship the Lord, notice, in the beauty of of holiness, of His holiness. That's how we worship the Lord. <laughs> uh, in other words, we don't want, oh, I, I'm worshiping God. Well, what God are you worshiping? What is He like? Is He holy? Is He a holy God? Uh, you see, uh, the holiness of God is really stands as the preeminent attribute or should be the preeminent attribute in the hearts and the minds of those who would truly worship Him. Let's look at another one, Psalm 99 9. Exalt the Lord of God. Exalt the Lord of God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. So the psalmist says, Worship at his holy hill. Why? For the Lord our God is holy. So what what is it that when we we we, we want to say we, we worship God? But how? The only way to truly worship Him is that we worship Him in His holiness. Uh, let's look at one more, Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. With Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Mm. So he says that his name is holy. That, that's a, a title that we can call God. And notice here, God says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And with him also, so you see, this is the response. And every time God speaks to man, what happens to man? He humbles himself. He worships. He bows down. He recognizes who God is, and He is the, the only true response when you see God in His holiness is to be of a contrite and a humble spirit. And He is the one that revives the heart of the contrite ones. You see, if we are going to worship God, what is the outcome of that worship? If it is true worship, if it is worship according to His holiness, the only response... The only place where true worship takes place is those who are of a contrite and a humble spirit. You see, someone who leaves a church service feeling good about themselves has not worshipped God. Now, someone who leaves the church service says, Wow, we have a mighty God, and He certainly is a holy God. And you have worshipped God. If we come amazed at who God is, humbled, of a contrite heart, that is the place of worship. That Why? Because that is the place where we recognize that God is holy. You see, the reason why we come to church so often is not to show how holy we are. It's to remind ourselves with how holy God is. Because you and I know that we're not holy. <laughs> we want to be. We strive to be. We desire to be like Him. But we know there is nothing that we can do to praise ourselves in our holiness. 
I'm going to leave, uh, leave it here because uh, the next one is really good. All right, I'll give it to you and then you'll have to wait for next week. But we're going to see that <coughs> the holiness of God is the attribute that can be ascribed to all of God's works. Uh, Psalm 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and, it's going to, and we're going to end up at the cross and we're going to look at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is communicated at the, at the cross? What happened at the crucifixion? I'm just letting you into all It's not a secret. You know this. But you remember what happened at the cross? The Holy of Holies and the big curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies was rent in twain. What is the chief message of the cross? What does it say to us about God? That He is holy. And we're going to talk about that next week, so you have to come back. All right? Uh, but let's pray and ask, ask the Lord to help us. You know, I think that uh, it's a good reminder because we're, we so soon forget that God is holy. And I do not believe that there is another attribute. Now, this is a, a personal statement, okay? I do not believe that there is another attribute that can cause a deeper change in our lives than that attribute. It's the first one that God wants us to know about Him. It's the basis of our fellowship. It's the one that must be preeminent in our hearts and minds if we are truly going to worship Him and is the only attribute that God directly calls upon to His people to exhibit in His likeness. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us.